So uh, it's a great pleasure today to have Dr. Lisa Prato uh, visiting us. And uh, I'm going to use my Italian pronunci pronunciation of Lisa's last name, because I guess that some, some, back in the past, she, uh, she has some Italian origins from the last name. Anyway, so Lisa uh, grew up in Boston area and attended the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, where she completed undergraduate degree in literature and astronomy and where also she discovered the world of scientific research. After a year as a non-degree graduate student at UMass, uh, Lisa moved to Colombia in South America and worked for three years as a professor in the Department of Physics at the Universidad Industrial de Santander in the city of Bucaramanga. Uh, when she was there, she taught classes in astronomy and astrophysics, and also she worked for a master's degree in physics. So Lisa returned to the US to complete a PhD in, um, at the uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook. And then after that, she moved uh, in two postdoctoral position at UCLA first with Dr. Andrea Guess, which you may know because she was a recent Nobel Prize winner uh, and Ian McLean. Uh, since 2004, Lisa has been a member of the science faculty at the Lower Observatory in Arizona. Lisa is an expert in young binary star and planet formation. She has uh, co-authored more than 100 astronomical publication. And uh, she has also been very active in outreach activities and uh, serving for the um, American, Astronomy, Ast American Astronomical Society, where she is currently uh, serving as co-chair of the publication committee. Uh, one of the fun fact about Lisa that uh, Doug mentioned before is that she has a minor planet, number 33929. Um, named after her, and uh, which is, I think, a nice thing to have. I would like to have one myself, <laughs> eventually. So uh, today, Lisa will give us a talk about the secret life of young binary star. And uh, uh, as usual, uh, if you have question, uh, I haven't asked you, Lisa, I don't know if you want to have question during your presentation, or if you prefer to have the question at the end. It's anybody? fine. If somebody wants to jump in, if, if there's a confusion or uh, I'm going too fast, please um, go ahead and, and uh, jump in and speak up. Um, so that would be great. I don't mind that at all. But I'm happy to answer questions at the end. And also we can talk more um, at the wine and cheese. Yeah, exactly. That's what so I want just to remind everybody that we're going to stay online for an informal uh, virtual one and she's after the colloquium. So with no further ado, I'll, uh, Lisa, I pass you the control. So you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, okay. great. Uh, I'm just going to move my, there we go. All right, the secret lives of young binary stars. So I'm very excited. I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to talk with you all today. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation. And I'm excited to talk about the science because I, you know, you wake up in the morning, I wanted to do the science. So it's extremely fun to talk about. And um, just a little hint, the secret lives are about the sort of things going on inside of these binary systems, which can be quite complex. And that's sort of illustrated here by this TWA3 system that I worked on a few years ago with a former undergraduate student. And uh, it's a it's a triple system with a disk of circumstellar material around the close binary. So that's just a sort of a taste of things to come here. Um, oops, let's see. All right. So my collaborators, my team, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work with some terrific students. The students here are all highlighted in gold and there's photos of a bunch of them. The ones in the top box are collaborators and students who are currently working with me and the bottom box are some who have moved on to other exciting opportunities. And the three things I want you all to take away today from this um, presentation are that, these are some of my, my uh, take home messages that most stars are in gravitationally bound multiple systems. And the multiple star environment has a significant impact on exoplanet formation and evolution. And binary stars are extremely useful for determining fundamental properties um, for um, young systems. So I'll talk in more detail, especially about the stuff in the red circle there. 
Here's a little outline of uh, the topics I'm going to cover. Uh, first, I'm going to say something about motivation, why binaries, um, some numbers, and, um, and then I'll set the context about star and planet formation and binary impact. And uh, I'll spend some time talking about data, the, the data that I have very painstakingly been collecting on this project and my approach and a little bit of um, some early results. And uh, I will say something, maybe just a few slides, but a little bit about testing paradigms um, using binaries as laboratories, using them as tools. And uh, in the middle here, this, this um, little figure showing a bunch of binaries and <clears throat> uh, multiple systems is um, from work I've been doing with Gail Schaefer and Mike Simon. It just shows these little squares are one arc second on a side. So this is very, very high angular resolution. Okay, and that spirit, I want, I know most of you know all of this, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, astronomers use strange units. Uh, so one AU or astronomical unit subtends one arc second at one parsec. We define the parsec by the by this, uh, the Earth's orbit, how much the Earth moves, and how much a star moves in parallax by one arc second. Uh, and so we use parsecs for distances and, and kiloparsecs and megaparsecs if you're looking at galaxies outside of the Milky Way. And um, the Taurus star forming region where many of the objects I'm going to talk about today are located is at about 140 parsecs from Earth. Um, and if you use the world's biggest infrared optical uh, telescope, the Keck 10 meter telescope, I use Keck 2, there's, there's two of them. Uh, and you work at about 1.6 microns, your, your Raleigh resolution is about uh, 0.04 arc seconds. And that's five AU at this distance of 140 parsecs. So that's the sun Jupiter distance. So that's, that's about how far we can get down. And you can use some groovy techniques to get a little bit closer than that, but, um, but that's our, our resolution that I'm going to talk about when I get to my data. I love this cartoon because this is titled um, Kepler's Uphill Battle. And so often you sit there, and, wait a minute, what did she say? What's a parsec? What's an AU? What's an orbit? What's a planet? So now a little bit of motivation and a little bit of history. So binary stars seem awfully 19th century. And when I was an undergraduate, I, it just, I had to kind of grit my teeth when I got to binary stars. Like they seem so boring to me. They seemed like these arcane things with these funny ellipses and, and oh, low mass binaries couldn't be more boring. You know, when I was an undergrad, I wanted like AGN and black holes and things that exploded. But, um, but the binaries have their place and they actually do explode. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, William Herschel is the person who sort of started, discovered, if you will, binaries. Um, he had been, along with many other astronomers back in the 18th century, he had been looking at these things and noticing that there were systems with two points of light um, that were very, very close and, and as opposed to single stars. I mean, they didn't have very big telescopes, but, um, but these were noteworthy and they were very close. And were these just coincidence or what was the story? So he kept watching them for, for decades. And in 1803, he said, aha, I got it. They're actually moving. I've looked at these data for for many years, for 25 years, and these are combinations of stars held together by mutual attraction. And about 50 years later, astronomers said, well, we're done. We found all the binaries, so let's move on. So, so it's just a, another, um, it's like 120 years ago when they said, well, we're done with physics, we fixed it all. Um, it, they were not done. Um, and this, this, is a, this plot on the right just shows one of these orbits from a paper in 1897 by, by Jefferson Jackson C. Um, he had a very long name. Ask me about him at the Wine and Cheese, an interesting character. So happily, people kept looking for binaries and finding more binaries. And this plot on the left here shows you that they did not give up in the 1850s. They, um, they continued, we have continued, astronomers have continued to look for binaries for, for hundreds of years. And um, we now have this, this understanding that they're, they're extremely common. And the frequency, if you look at this plot on the left, the frequencies on the y-axis and the primary star mass of the binaries on the x-axis in log. And for the very low mass things, the frequency is 20, 30%. And you get up to things like our sun, but one solar mass is getting up towards 50%. And you go to the higher mass stars and it's, it's mostly binaries up to the O stars, are almost all binaries. On the, on the right-hand side here, it just shows um, number versus um, mass. 
um, on the x-axis is mass. And this is the initial mass function, which is a standard tool that astronomers use to describe the distribution of, of masses of objects in, in clusters in our galaxy and the universe. And you notice that there are far more low mass objects and then high mass objects and the multiplicity of the low mass objects is less. But even so, we, you still can do the numbers and you're gonna come up with most stars are in binary systems or multiple systems. Also note that the low mass binaries, which is what I've ended up studying uh, in large part in my career is low mass binaries. And they are really exciting, they're not boring, um, but they really dominate. And that's, that's another reason why they are, why the low mass binaries are very important and the high mass ones, they do go bang. Um, it's challenging actually to avoid binaries. There's so many of them. If you want a clean quote unquote sample of pure singles, it's a challenge. Okay, so the ways in which people have found young binaries, which are also very frequent, uh, very common as their uh, older counterparts. Um, when you're looking at star forming regions, the near star forming regions are 140 parsecs away. So that's, you know, that's far. <laughs> um, and uh, when you're looking that far away, you really need some kind of special technique in order to get down into, into the secret lives, right? To get into detail and to, first of all, to discover that they're binary and second of all, to, to explore their properties. So starting in the eighties, people became interested in this work and this kind of work and looking at the young binaries and trying to understand what that meant for star formation, for example. So there's um, the lunar occultation work that was applied um, by Mike Simon to young stars starting in the late eighties. You see the, this nice plot on the left with the, as this system comes out from behind the moon, these little teeny dots, which are hard to distinguish are two millisecond exposures. And as this system came up from the moon, your, 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 your resolution is limited by how fast you can sample. And here comes one star and you see the Fresnel diffraction here and here comes the second star and you see another set of Fresnel fringes there. So that was a brilliant way of getting very close systems, of course, only in one dimension. Speckle interferometry in 1D was begun in the late 80s by, by um, Christoph Leiner and Mike Simon and, and their colleagues. Um, Andrea Ghez started working on young stars, looking for binaries um, using two-dimensional speckle um, in the early 90s. And uh, that was her thesis work, which she later started applying these high resolution techniques to the Galactic Center, which led to her Nobel Prize. Uh, and so this freezes out the, the image of your star all kind of crinkled up by the Earth's atmosphere. And um, what's advantageous is when you do speckle in the infrared because your, your, um, your coherence length in the atmosphere goes as wavelength, it's about wavelength to the sixth over five and, and your zenith angle. And so if you're in the infrared, you have a little bit of an advantage there. You have a longer coherence lake length and it's not quite so bad. So your scene is better. So when they started making adaptive optic systems, AO systems, they uh, also did these in the infrared. Um, I like this double plot over here on the right because it shows WSB 18 imaged, just plain old imaging by Reiperth and Zinnaker in this beautiful compilation of binaries that they published in the early nineties. But you can see this is 13 arc seconds on a side and they found a close binary, it was great. Uh, later work when we were following up on this um, system, um, uh, part, paper from 2018, it's the same star but <laughs> observed in 2015. Not only do we see that binary, we see that that, that primary on the right is, is also a close pair. So about 75% of the stars in Taurus uh, are multiples. So why binaries yet? Um, they are so many things that are, in, that are in, intrinsically important in astrophysics that involve binaries that uh, I could go on talking for an hour simply about how important binaries are. But just quickly, our process elements are thought now to probably form in the, um, in the merger of neutron stars. Uh, so everything that's purple in this periodic table, you need a binary to get it probably. Uh, gravitational waves, <coughs> it helps to have a binary to get those. Um, absolute stellar masses, and um, this plot here shows a spectroscopic binary, which I'm, I'm not talking about those today, but it just shows that you can use binaries to actually measure the individual component masses. You can measure the mass ratio and then you have some other information. You can get the component masses and, and plunk these down on, on these, these are model tracks. This is brightness or magnitude on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. 
and we can compare these dynamically measured masses to the models to help calibrate models. That's a very important application. Um, angular momentum distribution, and what I'm going to talk about today, planet formation and evolution. So not only are binaries common, it turns out planets are common. And uh, Lara Flagg and um, Asa Stahl gave um, the astronomy seminar this uh, today at noon, two talks by uh, each of them. And um, Lara talked about the Kepler mission. So that was perfect introduction. So Kepler uh, has populated all the yellow dots in this plot on the lower left here. And um, it was this space-based monitoring mission um, what patch of the sky, and it uh, discovered thousands of planets, candidate planets, many of which have been uh, confirmed. And so if you look at this, this population, this plot here in the lower left shows radius versus orbital period of this sample. So most of these um, yellow dots are short period planets uh, with radii around three or four Earth radii, um, up to 40 Earth radii. And, and, and they're very, very common. If you if you look at the, all of the exoplanets that have been discovered, this plot on the upper right by um, Kevin hardegree Ullman and collaborators um, shows the planets per star for only a small slice of this plot down here. It's just planets on very short periods, less than 10 days, so only the stuff over on the very left. And it's only planets with radii between about half and uh, a couple of uh, Earth radii. And you see these box and whisker diagrams, these probability distributions that um, the planets per star are very frequent for the low mass stars in particular, which are shown in this insect sort of broken out for different um, effective temperatures. And then in these yellow lines, you see for the warmer stars, okay, so they're not um, several planets per star per se, but this is, again, this is a very small slice of parameter space. So planets are common, no matter how you cut it, binaries are common, how do they mix? So this is the gist of my, of my, uh, exploration of my the problem that I'm working on here to characterize the nature of the impact of the binaries, the closed binaries and the formation of exoplanets by observing young systems. And uh, I will also say a little bit about um, something else I'm very excited about, which is using young binaries to explore how these, these planet, this planet forming material, these disks around young stars dissipate and evolve. And this uh, little figure here just shows uh, two stars or their disks, two young stars, um, in Taurus, uh, image in a millimeter by Jensen and Ackeson. Okay, so let's look into some context and um, say something about how stars and, and how binaries and um, stars form and the binary impact. All right, so Andrea, I apologize. I, I found this on the internet and it's from your thesis, it says, so I hope I got that right. But I really love this cartoon in particular. If you Google cartoon star formation, you'll find many, many cartoons that are very lovely. But this one in particular, I love because it's very, it's very um, straightforward and it has these nice white um, bars with the, with the distance scales of the different stages. So stars form in the very cold cores of molecular, interstellar molecular clouds. This isn't, these aren't great big gapping, gaping holes in the stellar background. These are dark, cold clouds. Um, with just a little bit of dust. Um, Laura Flagg mentioned today that the, the gas to dust ratio is like 100. It doesn't take much dust to obscure um, in a cloud or in a circumstellar disk. But deep down in these clouds, you have to find cold cores, 10, 20 Kelvin degree cores, in order to form stars, uh, sort of counterintuitively, because you, you can't have the gas moving too fast. You, gravity has to win and, and start to collapse this core. So you have to have very cold gas and it has to be very enshrouded and sort of protected from the radiation field so that the gas doesn't heat up and move too fast. And once you get this gravitational collapse beginning and the decoupling from the cloud around it, you have this sort of top part of the cartoon here. And on the scale of thousands of astronomical units, you have this core collapse. You turn on um, thermonuclear deuterium burning in the core of the star and eventually that, that radiation propagates out and you form jets and winds. Um, there's some kind of, and how this happens, I would, I would love to explore more about because this is a, a, a mystery. But at some point, these cores develop some preferential angular momentum and you have some um, rotation. And along that rotational axis, material will fall down into the disk and your, your jets and your winds will clear out um, the, the remaining material in this 
in this shell around the young star. Now you have a system on the order of hundreds of AU. And with some more evolution, once that wind has, and the young star has photo evaporated the rest of the material or it's accreted onto the outer part of the disk, you end up with your young star and disk. And then eventually, and that's in the order of our solar system, the size of our solar system is about 40 AU in radius, that's distance out to Pluto. And then eventually you've got some remnant gas and dust and you have a planet forming or formed and, and that's on the scale of the Sun-Jupiter separation, our, our 5 AU. And, and so it's very clever um, that these cartoons have been developed long before these observations, but um, there we go. These, um, it's, it's sort of remarkable how, how um, uh, reality follows art in this case. And these are the, um, some very recent results from different missions from Herschel and from um, the adaptive optics system, the sphere system on the European Very Large Telescopes in Chile, and um, of course the ALMA. So these, these little real observed images uh, really replicate the stages um, in, this, in this schematic um, remarkably well. So we're, we've been on the right track, we're getting it right. How do we know that planets form in circumstellar disks? This is an important thing to address. Um, the, the most obvious answer is because we see them there. Um, this is a famous image of Beta Pictoris um, in a paper from Anne-Marie Lagrange. You can see this little white dot here at about 11 o'clock. That's the planet Beta Pic B that has been imaged in the system. The, the, she used this special chronographic system to, to sort of null out the central star, which is why it looks dark. It's not actually a black hole. And uh, this is a composite image. So the, also in this composite, you can see the plane of the disk. And this is just one example of systems that have been, that have been shown to have, um, that have been imaged with disks in, uh, with planets in the disk plane. Also, um, for hundreds of years, I've been hypothesizing philosophers of, philosoph philosophers hypothesizing about uh, the formation of our own solar system and how other solar systems might form. And we have a lot of now of validation from the Kepler mission. We have this, the, the Kepler missions just stared at the same spot of the sky, hundreds of thousands of stars for four years, and, and these little transits of the stars past the, past the central star, the planets past the central star, showed these little dips, and that tells you that there's a planet there. But some of the systems had two, three, four, or five, they had many planets, so it's remarkable. And, um, and they were all in the same plane, we wouldn't have seen the transits from all of them. There are systems of planets that appear to orbit their central stars out of the plane. And that's a very interesting topic um, of, of a lot of interesting work being done on that. But I think it's safe to say that the fact that the planetary orbital inclinations in our solar system and in other systems indicate that there was planet formation in a disk. Also, that's where the raw material is as the system evolves. So from here on out, this is a very, very important point. I'm gonna be talking about disks as proxies for planets. So when I say disk, think planet, and or at the very least, think planet potential. Okay. So what happens when we have a binary? Um, our Tim Woods and Lubau did very nice um, smooth particle hydrodynamical simulations back in the 90s, looking at the effect of um, binarity for a variety of mass ratios and eccentricities on um, the survival and the, and the size of circumstellar disks in binaries. And they, they have this um, sort of rough rule of thumb. You can have the outer radius of a disk about one third of the binary separation. So this is great. We have a number and um, that's been, I think, confirmed in, um, by other, by other um, simulations. So therefore they have to be smaller, the disks and binaries. And that's been seen in, in many studies of um, unresolved binaries. So we know it's, a, it's, we know it's a binary from a lunar occultation or from speckle or adaptive optics image, but that's about all we know. And there's been beautiful work done by many teams, um, Lucas Ciesa and colleagues, Andrews and Williams. Uh, many groups have looked at the unresolved systems and they've seen the evidence for a disk or, or no evidence for a disk. And you can say something about the the binary separation and whether or not there seems to be some disk material in there without actually looking in detail. And, and 
these kinds of studies in the millimeter and the mid infrared, these kinds of studies have confirmed that the disks and binaries are smaller and um, less massive than the singles. I just took our, Andrea's cartoon and, and shoved everything together because of course it's more complicated than this, but, but keep this in mind through the talk. Every time we think about star formation and planet formation, we always love to think about a single star. I do it too, but it's more complicated than that because most of these young stars are in these multiple configurations. So uh, a few years ago, Adam Krauss looked at the, just, the, the, just taking this large sample of, of unresolved um, uh, sort of disk, disk indicators and looked at what's the difference between singles and binaries. And so this is sort of reiterating what I just said, but you see the singles are up here for this for Taurus, uh, about 80% disk frequency, wide binaries, greater separations greater than about 50 AU. Wide binaries have similar disk frequency. They might be smaller, they might be less massive, but the frequency is similar. But the closed binaries just dives down there and you have many fewer disks. And this is for Taurus. The, the stars in Taurus are two or three million years old. These are very, very young stars, sort of newly, newly emerged from their molecular cloud. And, um, and so that's very interesting, but not unexpected, given that last slide with the binaries all on top of each other. What's really interesting to me, this is expected, right? The, the something's going to happen, something bad's going to happen in the disks. But, but why, why do we get the two that survive, the four that survive, the seven that survive in these different separation bins? So that to me is the cool thing. And it's been exactly. also, yeah. Sorry, can I, can I ask you a question about this figure? Yeah. So these disks are circumbinary disk or disk around each component? Thank you for that question. Um, it's around each component because the kinds of um, diagnostics that um, Krauss used to do this analysis were, uh, I think it's like infrared colors, near infrared colors, and mid infrared. And I think he also used some hydrogen alpha, which is, I'll, I'll say something about that a little bit later, but it's an indicator of accretion from the disk onto the star. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. So, so for, I'm talking about um, circumstellar disks and, 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 and that's an important distinction because circumbinary disks exist too, and they're very interesting. But, um, but yeah, circumstellar disks are sort of my focus here. Okay, just to recap, binaries, whether they're old or young, are common. Planets are common. Planets form in disks around stars. Disks in close binaries are small, low mass, vulnerable. But why do some of them, why do some of these close binaries hold on to their disks and therefore can potentially form planets? So now I'm going to talk about data approach and um, sample. Okay, so. I have been collecting data for this project for many years um, through um, observations of the Keck telescope and um, the some a few seasons of data from the very large telescope. Um, I, I have a quiz at the end, what is wrong with this picture? And I will sort of circle this down here for keen observers and we can talk about that at the wine and cheese. But um, the VLT or a bunch of eight meter telescopes, the cry -ray spectrograph has just been refurbished and is newly on them. but. This was about 10 years ago with Jean-Louis Monin um, at the Observatoire in Grenoble. We got some data from, from the VLT and I've been collecting a lot of data at Keck. And these are important um, observational sets because they're infrared data. So the scene is better. The um, resolution that I've been using is very high, 60,000, uh, sorry, uh, 30,000. Uh, the sample is relatively large, which is why it's taken me years. But, but they're behind the adaptive optic system. So these are angularly resolved um, observations. And that is really important. High resolution spectroscopy at high angular resolution is, is key to this program. And over the years of, of accumulated data and dozens of nights, um, this is just the near spec in spectrograph inside its little shroud, little blanket when it was off, off the telescope. Um, and also recently we have, um, and my collaborator Ben Toffelmeyer at UT, he, uh, he and I and some other colleagues got time on ALMA for cycle seven, which got post postponed, but hopefully we'll get that data this year. And um, the Kepler, um, the K2 mission has looked after Kepler that used the telescope to look along the ecliptic and that has some great um, photometry, sort of continuous photometry of 
young stars that complement the spectra that I've been getting. And then the little teeny tiny 31 inch telescope and Flagstaff also for photometry, I've been using that. So here's the sample on the upper left, the um, disc and non-disc bearing um, system. So I have both for comparison and um, about 50% have discs, 50 don't. Uh, the sample is about hundred total and uh, separations for about half of them are below 50 AU and um, the rest are wider. These little plots on the right give you a sense of all the spectra I've been collecting. I know it's difficult to look at them in detail. And uh, if you want, I can like show you later. <laughs> but they're, to me, they're like, uh, it's like candy. It's like going into a candy store. <laughs> There's candy all over the place. Um, they're just so exciting. Every single one has a little story to tell. And I've got a hundred of these. So the kinds of things in a, that a disc um, gives us in terms of information from the different processes. We have the young star at the center. These young stars have magnetic fields of several thousand Gauss stronger than the sun's um, average magnetic field. So 2000, 3000 Gauss. Um, and you have the magnetic field lines lock into the little teeny bit of plasma in the disc. You have enough cosmic ray hits to, to ionize maybe one part in, in 10 to the fifth. And the, that's enough for the magnetic field to lock on the disc. And that actually regulates the angular momentum of the star. Um, you get accretion, gas accretion from the sort of pink and green zones. You get accretion onto the star that gives you ionized hydrogen and, and excited hydrogens. You have hydrogen emission lines. That gas is warm, so you can get sodium in emission, CO in emission, you have all these nice diagnostics spectroscopically. The dust, the gas to dust ratio, it's 100, but a little bit of dust goes a long way. So you can see the, the dust, the sublimation radius in here in the inner edge of the dust part of the disk. You can get continuum emission from there. Um, you can get UV excess from um, Bremsterlung and optical excess from Bremsterlung and the, in the plasma at the accretion shock. It's all this great stuff. Um, millimeter continuum emission, far infrared, near infrared, this, it's great. Don't forget, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. We've got two stars. So the kinds of, the kinds of um, data that I've been collecting, this is a little case study of DF tau, um, just one out of 100, but um, we published some of these data already a few years ago. And um, it's a really interesting system because the two stars are very, very similar in terms of temperature, but have very different properties. From these, from these spectra, these are the spectra that I get from Keck, we can measure temperatures, we can measure surface gravities, how, how fluffy is the star? That's what surface gravity is, that's a technical term. Um, the magnetic field strength, the radial velocity, the projected rotation velocity, so how fast the, the, the surface of the star is moving modulo the inclination, the sign of the inclination. Um, and with ancillary data, imaging, um, adaptive optics imaging so that you can see both stars and you can look at different wavelengths. You can, you can determine something about luminosities from this ground-based um, time domain or space-based Kepler K2 time domain following the fluxes. You can get information about the rotation period of the stars. So that's this tremendous um, wealth of data that we can collect about the stars. So um, this is a portion of the project that um, we've been collaborating with uh, Chris Johns Crawl on this, um, developing a synthetic grid using state-of-the-art models and line lists and calibrating these, um, these properties for this, for this grid, for this whole sort of stretch of properties that we're covering in these low mass stars. So temperatures from about 3000 to 5000 Kelvin, surface gravities from about three to log G of about three to five, um, magnetic field strengths from zero to about six kilogauss. Uh, and, um, and, and we're creating this, you know, populating this grid and then taking our observed spectra and running it through the grid and interpolating to find the properties of the observed spectra. This, these three panels show the top left is different effective temperatures holding surface gravity and magnetic field constant. Lower left, we're holding temperature and magnetic field constant and changing the surface gravity. And then the upper right one shows the, the changes in magnetic field with the other properties held constant. That's, it's fantastic. I mean, I could just sit around and look at these figures. 
it, it's beautiful. <laughs> you change things and the spectra change. And so it's, it's very clear. But um, we've calibrated these very these models very carefully to our data to observe data on standards like the sun and um, a bright um, standard low mass standard stars. Here's some very very initial results. My uh, undergrad intern Cody Halls has been working very hard, and uh, Chris has been helping with this. Um, some initial fits to DF tau. When when Cody sent me these fits the other day, and and the the observed. Uh, spectra are in black and the models are in red. And, and I was really excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to work on my talk, but I really want to look at all these models because he sent several different epochs. DF Tau is a star that I've, that I've been observing multiple times. And so I can actually look at how the, the different properties are changing from year to year. So I, I, I'm sort of beside myself with excitement about this. And it's very satisfying to be getting results from this now. It's, we're still tweaking it, but um, this gives you a sense. The, the little divots where the models disagree, I think are mostly because of noise and the spectrum. Although the signal to noise is quite good. It's greater than hundred for the most part, but it's also how we've normalized the continuums a little bit off here and there. So this is a really work in progress. So from the orbits, we get a whole other set of information. Um, it takes a while to, to, to follow an orbit around, but it's, it gives you the absolute total mass of the system and it gives you the inclination, which is very, very interesting to compare with other properties. And then you get the, the, standard, um, the standard orbital parameters, eccentricity, semi-major axis, the, the separation. Um, it was point out in this plot that people started observing DF tau soon after they figured out it was a binary in the late 80s. And um, these were speckle observations with large uncertainties. We started observing it at Keck in the early, the early aughts. So these black points are our Keck observations and you see how they fall like beads on a string. Um, and uh, and we, we published part of this orbit, we added a point in 2019, but we published some of this in this paper with my um, former postdoc, Tom Allen, a few years ago. Um, and so, so the, the orbits are, um, are, are they're very, very useful because that knowing that inclination and seeing the relative positions, hopefully, as I talk about the disks in a minute with Alma will, will be very powerful. And the thing about the orbits is you, you can't necessarily wait this for DF tau, it's probably about 40 years. You can't wait for 40 years. So, <laughs> because um, we won't be here. So, so how do you figure out something about the orbit? So a lot of these stars, the um, first observations were in the 80s and 90s. So for those, if we have enough data, we can actually figure out pretty good orbit arcs for many of these very close systems. And even when a period is long, like as for DF tau, if you look at just the arc of, um, so now we have about two thirds of the orbit um, mapped out. But if you look at just the arc of the last of about 25% of the orbit, you can still use um, you can still use a Monte Carlo um, grid search in order to find relatively good 5-10% precision um, inclinations and total masses. So some parameters uh, this shows the one, two, and three confident um, one, two, and three sigma confidence levels, and so the the red is the one sigma confidence level. And so certain things like um, the inclination, which is on the y-axis and the period is on the x-axis, but the inclination was pretty good. This top one shows the whole sort of two thirds that we, are, that we have. And this bottom plot shows only like the last 12 years of this orbit. Okay, so these are a good 12 years, but still the inclination for the, for the three sigma confidence levels is between about 132, 142. And um, the actual number is somewhere around 143, 144. So for inclination, you can do pretty well. You, know, you get 1% precision with the whole, all the data we have, but still, even with an orbit arc, we can extract some information. So that's very valuable. So with, for the disks, we can do all sorts of things to see if, is there one disk in the system? Are there two? What are their inclinations? If there's one, is it around the primary star, the secondary star? How big is the disk? What is the structure in the disk? Um, and to do this, you can use the photometry. You can use the multi-wavelength fluxes. So this top left shows you the flux 
compared to the wavelength. And um, you see for many different wavelengths, the, the primary for DF tau, again, this is DF tau, plotted in blue um, and the secondary plotted in red. And you see an excess in the ultraviolet that indicates hot gas at the accretion shock. And you see this excess in the infrared. The green points are unresolved. So um, I'm not gonna talk about them, but, but you clearly see that there's, there are these excesses that indicate um, warm dust in the primary star that is not present in the secondary. We can go a little bit further. We can even explore something about the temperature of that dust by subtracting um, a black body or a, 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 or a synthetic um, spectrum that imitates the, the, um, the spectral energy distribution of the star and you're left over with the information from the disk. This just shows the longer wavelengths and doing that for a different system that's some work I did um, actually working with Andrea uh, years ago. And, and here you can fit a black body now to what you've subtracted off to the, to the actual dust um, just the dust, and you can say something about the temperature of the dust, and something about the composition. This shows this little divot here at 10 microns, that's from a silicate. So it's, it's very, very powerful doing this, these spectral energy distributions if you, can, if you can get the resolved data at multiple wavelengths, which you can do with the, with the adaptive optics, with the AO, on, and with interferometry as well. The, um, okay, so you can use these other techniques as well to get at the disks. Alma has really revolutionized disks around young stars in this phenomenal way. I, I, really, I really think that the NSF scored. I, uh, you know, they want transformational projects. They really got it. With Alma, it is transformational. This is, is not one of my targets, but I, I love this image because it really shows you two close disks imaged separated by only 10 AU. So this is exactly the kind of data that we are hoping to get from our cycle seven um, time that we were awarded for a subsample of this larger sample. And, and um, what I wanna know is, for example, for DF tau, are we gonna see this? Or are we gonna see uh, the disk is perpendicular to the orbit? Or, or you know, I, we think it's gonna be something like this because we don't see evidence for circumstellar material or at least much circumstellar material around the secondary star. But, um, but I hope this is the kinds of data that we can extract from the ALMA time and hopefully we will get that this year. Spectroscopy also provides us with data about the disk, not just about the star. It's great, like you look at a spectrum like this, again, this is not DF tau, but it was, it was an exemplary spectrum. So I wanted to show this, but if you have uh, hydrogen emission lines, that's the hot gas hitting the, at the accretion shock and being ionized and recombining. And, um, and so you get hydrogen emission. Very typically, you get Balmer alpha, you get H alpha, you get um, bracket gamma, but only in very, very energetic events would you get bracket 16. So, so that's pretty neat. Another um, flag that indicates a disk in a spectrum is veiling. So veiling is simply that in the infrared is mostly from the from that dust sublimation radius, that warm dust in the in that wall, uh, the the inner part of the dust part of the disk. You have all these little grains emitting, and so that's creating your infrared continuum, and that fills in your 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 absorption lines. So you see this veiled effect. Um, you notice that it's not so strong in the secondary here. So that, that veiling is another signpost of um, the presence of a disk. <clears throat> I've highlighted these lines because I love these lines. They're great sensitive temperature indicators because as you get hotter, the iron gets deeper and the OH goes away. And as you get cooler, the OH comes in and the iron goes away. It's like my favorite part of the spectrum. Plus there's no telluric absorption lines in this part of the spectrum. So that helps a lot. Variability is another signpost for uh, the presence of a disk because, and this is, this is again a fantastic sort of field of, um, of, of active research and, and it's, it's not well understood, which, I, which to me makes it really fun, but some of these young stars are tremendously uh, variable, huge variations of, of uh, many factors. So this plot on the upper right shows the V magnitude for DF tau, um, A in blue and B in red. And it's plotted in magnitude. So these, these funny units that astronomers use, one magnitude is a factor of two and a half. 
um, because our eyes see logarithmically. So this is how the magnitude was established as our unit of brightness um, because astronomy started with the eye. So you see that the, the primary star was very variable and the secondary star was not so variable at all. And this, these data were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope back in um, starting in the 90s and going through about 2004. And uh, this was the fine guidance sensors could actually separate this very small separation system and, and, and give these great data on each component, which is very valuable because this figure down here that my um, grad student Lauren Biddle put together, this light curve from, um, from the K2 data, the Kepler-2 data, shows all this variability. Again, this is DF tau. But in, in this case, we don't have the separation. Kepler is a pretty small telescope, and it's in space, so hard to get that. But we know from this that, that probably we can attribute most of this variability to the primary. And, and amazingly enough, in many of these crazy looking light curves, you can do the, you can calculate the power spectra and you can pull out the rotation periods of both stars. It's, it's non-trivial, but, um, and in some cases it's uncertain, but it's a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful application. Okay, so I hope you are um, excited about this data as I am about these data because there's many, many, many things that um, I am planning to do with it. And it's, it's such a valuable, powerful data set. So I don't have the, the sort of final word to give you, but I can tell you what I am going to look at. And, and I've got these data sets on the stars, on each star, angularly resolved, on the, on the magnitudes and the near infrared from the adaptive optics imaging. So when we image the orbits, we also automatically get the, the colors, um, the K minus L, um, H minus K, you know, the near infrared, different magnitudes in the near infrared. And we can, we can use those to understand something about the temperature of the dust and whether there's a, a gap in the disk and there's only warm dust or if there's also hot dust. Um, so we can cross correlate all these properties. And then hopefully we will have not just our, our own ALMA data from cycle seven if that, when that comes through, but also there's rich sets of ALMA data in the literature that we can draw on. And that's also um, complementing this project. So there are many, many different things that I'm going to be cross, cross um, not exactly cross correlating, but comparing and looking for statistically significant correlations and, um, and uh, hopefully understanding much better why we are getting some of these disks and these close binaries that, that hang in there and that can go on to form planets. Um, I, my plan is to do statistical tests to compare the stellar and orbital properties, both in the diskless and the disk samples and both in the close and the wider binary. So that's, that's very important to have some of these systems that have been unresolved characterized as diskless for comparison. And then hopefully I'll be able to look a little bit at the results as a function of different star forming regions. Almost all of these data are from Taurus and Ophiuchus star forming regions. Um, and there's a few systems from other regions as well. So this is sort of a, almost a cartoon. There's a little bit of, of chi by eye analysis that I had done uh, uh, just like a year ago before um, we reached the stage of getting these models um, to extract the data, but just this little subsample um, of stars that I've been looking at, it is quickly compared. These are some of the things that I'm planning to compare. You know, how does the veiling differ for a separation? Well, you get to a little bit wider binary, the veiling is a little bit more, that's, that sort of makes sense. Um, what about the veiling compared to um, the effect of temperature? So note that I'm showing in this plot on the upper left, um, only the very close objects. So there's more objects actually plotted down here in, in, the, in the other plot as well. So at the bottom here, I'm looking at veiling as a function of effective temperature. Interestingly, the primaries that are warmer seem to have larger veiling, which means more substantive disks. The secondaries, which are the red triangles, don't seem to show that. Um, again, this is very, very um, many sigma results. So, and I'm going to be repeating it once we complete all the, the real fine analysis. And then on the right here, um, not surprisingly for things that are rotating very rapidly. So the projected rotation velocity is high. 
and you have low veiling, that's not unexpected because that indicates that the star and the disk have decoupled, so the disk has dissipated or started to dissipate. What's interesting is that you have fairly high veiling for these things with 20 to 30 kilometer per second rotation. Okay, so let me say a few words about testing paradigms using binaries as laboratories. Um, and so I start with a true confession. Uh, and this is not new. Um, a star in planet formation, or I should say, or disk science really has this serious problem because we don't actually know why sometimes we get rapid disk dissipation in some systems and not in other systems. And this is true in single stars as well as binaries. You can go out and you can take a big sample of single, young single stars and you can calculate their ages. Let's say they're all in, let's just say for, um, for an example, they're all in the Taurus star forming region. And we take their, um, we take their, we take their ages and they're maybe two to three to four million years old. And then we go and we look at all these great diagnostics for disks and we discover that half of them have disks and half of them don't. And it doesn't seem to be a function of age. So I showed Andrea's beautiful cartoon, the schematic with, you know, this sort of, you're moving along from the cloud core to the sort of embedded young star to the young star in the disk or the young star in the like little disk debris left over. And we think of that always in terms of an age progression, but, but, and eventually there is some kind of progression because once you get past about 10 million years, things don't seem to retain their disks, but it's not somehow between one and 10 million years, there's not a simple story and we don't, we haven't solved it. So why does this happen even with single stars? So this, this is a little research note that um, Mike Simon and I did a couple of years ago because we did this in the mid, and when we deal with the late 90s, we had a paper and it showed a similar thing. And we went, oh, well, we'll redo it. Maybe it'll all be clear. And it's not. And a lot of other work shows the same thing. You have this huge spread of ages when you have full primordial disks, when you have disks that are, have gaps and central holes in them because they're starting to dissipate. And when you have evolved disks um, that have the completely evolved. On this y axis, we're showing the K minus W3 from the WISE mission. So it's a, it's a mid infrared color, which is very sensitive to the presence of a disk to warm dust or even warmish coolish dust in a disk. So it's a very sensitive disk diagnostic compared to age here. This gap is beautiful. What this means is that transition from having a disk to not having a disk happens really fast. It's very hard to catch things in that, in that gap. Um, and so, so there's, there's this problem here and my thinking is that it's going to be very um, useful to use the wide binaries to explore this because the wide binaries are a built-in laboratory. The, the, the two stars in a wide binary have the same formation, the same age, the same formation environment, the same radiation environment. Uh, the composition is the same. Uh, the, the binary separation um, is, is nice and big. Uh, not for all of them. Some of them are an arc second or half an arc second, which means um, you know, 70 AU or 100 AU, 120, 40 AU. But um, okay, so the disks might be smaller, but even so the two stars, are, they're not mashing into each other's disk. So the separation is large enough so that the, the impact is minimal. So this is my, my idea to use binary systems as these little laboratories. So is it, is it, you know, these are the kinds of possibilities I'm considering. Is it higher order multiplicity? We can start with that. And I already sort of threw that out a little bit earlier. This was my um, plot on my title slide and it shows this TWA triple. So it's a, it's a wide binary, um, like one to two arc second binary. And it's moving slowly because 1992 it was here and recently it's only moved a little teeny bit in its orbit arc. These rainbow colors are just a family of probable orbit solutions based on as much information as we know. And then, and this is single, but the, 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 the binary in, in this gray thing in here is actually a circumbinary disk. And in the middle here, there's a spectroscopic binary with an orbital period uh, of about, I think it's 34 days. And so these are actually are, are far enough apart that the, 
an interferometer um, at the VLT telescope, the European VLT telescope, is actually managed to image the separation of the spectroscopic binary. And that inner gap in that disk is only about 0.8 AU. And so these are little probable families for the, for the orbits of uh, two stars in that spectroscopic binary. Spectroscopic binary just means it's detectable only with spectroscopy. Um, but since they did it interferometrically, <laughs> they've separated it. I guess it's, it's a spectroscopic slash visible binary or visual binary. Um, or that's just the genesis of that, of that phrase. <clears throat> so no, it's not higher order multiplicity that destroys the disk, that destroys the, the disk around one of the components because the component with no disk is single. <laughs> the component with a disk is a binary. Um, is it perturbations? Are, are flybys common enough um, to give rise to perturbations? There was a recent paper about the genesis of hot Jupiters from stellar flybys. I, I just saw the title, so I can't tell you anything about it, but um, is it very rapid rotation? Somehow does the disk decouple from the star and um, disintegrate? Uh, is it something about the magnetic fields, rapid grain growth? So we, we really don't know. So that's my hope is to explore those. Just before I go to my last um, summary slide, I um, just wanted to say something again about these little postage stamps that I showed from um, those paper with Gail Schaefer from a couple of years ago. These, this work that I do with um, Gail and Mike is in order to measure the masses. Um, so we're using binaries in a different way as, um, as uh, dynamically in order to measure young star masses and to calibrate these models of pre-main sequence evolution by, um, <clears throat> by mapping out the orbits and the very close pairs because we can, we can do that um, in some reasonable period of time and also measuring the radial velocities from the spectroscopy. So that's another way that binaries are used as tools. Okay, so forgive me <laughs> for this extremely busy slide here. Um, I, um, I, I just wanna give you a sense of the sort of the complexity, but also the richness of these, the two parts of this, these projects. On the, on the center here, I'm showing all these different pieces of data and information that I have accumulated on this sample of about 100 young binaries and uh, temperature, velocity, orbital elements, color excess, magnetic fields, you know, this, this, the potential for all this information. And then uh, goal one on the left is why do some close pairs have disks and, and then form planets um, or have the potential to form planets. And in green here are various ideas that might account for that. And in the, the black arrows are sort of my spider web of which different piece of data could contribute to which idea. Uh, and on the right is this question I just talked about, what drives the early disk evolution and um, the same thing. So here's a variety of ideas and the different pieces of data that can plug into that. Um, okay. All right, so, and what comes next? Finished calibration of the of the grid of synthetic spectra and um, start sort of churning those out, running the observed spectra for each component and each target binary through the grid, correlating all these properties. And uh, for the multi-epoch observations, testing the variability, I find that extremely exciting and, um, and populate this database. So this is um, linked off my website, which is terribly out of date, but um, this is this database that we've set up um, and it has, it has live links for some of the spectra, the, each component um, individually, or in some cases they're unresolved. But um, what the idea is to provide all this information for the community. So we have the, 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 the rotational, projected rotational velocity, temperature, bailing, all the different properties. So that um, hopefully we'll be able to I'll be able to do that in the next year or two and complete this database and, and just make that available to anybody. Okay, that's my timer. So main points, most stars are in multiple systems. The multiple star environment has a significant impact on exoplanet formation. Binary stars are great for determining fundamental properties. And I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, for the great talk. I'll clap for everybody. <laughs>